The Darkness is a horror-themed first-person shooter based on some comic book I've never heard of. The game is by the delightfully named Starbreeze Studios, whose most notable previous title would be The Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay, in which players piloted a claymation Vin Diesel in his ongoing quest to masturbate himself raw in the faces of audiences worldwide. Anyway, the Darkness demo starts with the hero Jackie in the back of a car, being driven by some of his Italian mobster friends, who have apparently abandoned the Mafia's pretense of respectability in order to drive recklessly through the streets at full speed like a pair of gibbering twats. In no time at all, the police find something objectionable about this behaviour and pursue them, prompting a pitch high-speed exchange of gunfire. Jackie, who looks for all the world like a cross between Kevin Spacey, Benicio Del Toro and Morticia Adams, is handed a shotgun to join in the fun, but the device seems to confuse him and he sits loading shells into it so slowly and carefully you'd think he was assembling a ship in a bottle. Meanwhile, the car is swerving wildly back and forth and bullets are whizzing through the air and by the time Jackie figures out which end of the gun is which, an almighty crash hurls him from the vehicle and into the actual game. He awakens in a cemetery where we are told through some shitty exposition that his mafia boss uncle has betrayed him and sent some hitmen to make him dead, presumably because he's sick of having to babysit the gormless fuckwit, something I could fully sympathize with through the subsequent gunfight. The clunky PS3 controls combined with Jackie's utter lack of survival instinct meant my top speed was somewhere in the region of slow walking pace while hitmen ran around popping caps in my dopey arse. Fortunately, at more or less this point, the titular darkness enters the fray and a bunch of giant licorice twizzlers sprout from Jackie's spine. Our hero is ostensibly possessed by some ancient all-powerful demonic force which looks very scary but it absolutely bugger all to assist as I ran around the cemetery for half an hour trying to find the way out. My only usable darkness power at that point was something that allowed me to extrude one of the licorice twizzlers to explore tight spaces and I spent most of the time fruitlessly trying to find a way to make it penetrate a flimsy iron gate before discovering that what I was supposed to do was go back to an easily missed white spot on the ground, use it to summon an evil imp, and instruct it to move a thoughtlessly parked car out of the way of one of the cemetery entrances. Let me just reiterate that. The game literally has me summon a multi-fanged beclawed monstrosity from the depths of hell, not so I can make it enslave the innocent or lay waste to all worldly nations but so that I can enlist it as my own personal breakdown service. I couldn't play the game for much longer because a short time later I found myself stuck outside another locked gate with no idea of how to proceed. The game's only hint to what to do was that I had just unlocked a new darkness power that allowed me to pick up heavy objects. I tried throwing a car at the sealed gates, but lacking a throw button, all I could do was rub it against the metalwork. Then I had the brainwave of setting up a pile of crap to form a staircase to get up onto a nearby roof, but the moment I got up there I ran headlong into an invisible wall because apparently I wasn't supposed to be doing that. I took my frustrations out on a nearby hobo before saying fuck this shit and doing something else. The Darkness has been getting some pretty good reviews all over the place that use phrases like brilliant storytelling and top-notch presentation which give me cause to hesitate before I use phrases like monstrous pile of shit. Most of my problem is with the horrible controls and the mouse and keyboard interface would swiftly fix that. And maybe after the rocky beginning the game is nothing short of fan dabby babulous but the demo's job was to make me want to buy the full version and in that regard it's a big dark gothy failure. Personally at this point I'd only consider buying the full version of The Darkness if it came down to budget price. And they threw in another better game. And some cake. And Belgium. Fable is by Lionhead Studios, home of longtime auteur game designer Peter Molyneux, who has a tendency to promise the earth and be ultimately crippled by his own ambition. See the big fat broken monkey fest black and white. During the development of Fable, for example, it was promised to have features like rival NPC characters, plants growing in real time, and a system wherein your every slightest choice and action changes your appearance in the world around you. What we ended up with was a buggy action RPG with a great big stiffy for itself. Anyway, the game takes place in the land of Albion, a generic fantasy world about two miles across, where most of the population are heavily accented immigrants from every conceivable part of the British Isles. The main character starts off as a fresh-faced farm boy whose origin story reads like the first chapter of the totally unoriginal guide to RPG hero motivation. Needless to say, his idyllic lifestyle is tragically interrupted when his family is slaughtered in front of him, his village is burned down, and he is sent away to learn the ways of combat and heroism from a convenient local academy. The big selling point, of course, is that you can choose to be a good character or an evil character, so I, of course, set out to be the evilest bastard who ever lived, and the best way to do this according to the game, was to dress in black, grow a big moustache, draw all over my face, and backhand the occasional passerby. I also set myself up as a magic user because I wanted to end up looking like Ming the Merciless, but the starting spells were also ridiculously piss-weak that I ended up having to use a sword half the time anyway, and the game ended up dubbing me a spell warrior, which made me feel like it was calling me an indecisive prick. Later, my alignment allowed me to learn a spell called Evil Pentagram Soul Suck Horror that when cast, froze and maimed everyone in the vicinity for massive damage and dragged their souls down into the darkest waste of the Stygian pit, and after that things became almost insultingly easy. I made sure to only take the evil side quests, and most of them had you do very little beyond wipe out legions of flimsy guardsmen. Even as I neared the end of the game and I found myself becoming rapidly outclassed by my enemies, the amount of gold I had acquired was so ridiculously unbalanced that I was able to buy three houses and still have enough left over to buy every health potion in the district. One of the things you can do apart from the main quest is seduce and marry virtually anyone in the land, regardless of gender, although there didn't seem to be any reason to do so, and I was so twisted and unattractive from all the peasants I had been maiming that the only person I could get to marry me was the evil femme fatale character who only did so to keep my mouth shut about the skeletons in her closet. The way she pitched it to me, I thought we were going to partner up in an unstoppable superstar tag team to take over the world together, but after the wedding all she did was hang around the town centre criticising my taste in facial hair. Fable is supposed to be all about choice, but it's really just the same choice over and over again, between either mawkish virtue 
you or are extravagant and malevolent with no apparent middle ground. For example, there's a cast of major NPCs whom you run across regularly throughout the adventure, and for virtually all of them there's a point where you can choose between either doing their bidding or slitting their throat. It's an option that personally I appreciated having, but since the game has to find a way to carry on regardless, no matter who you murder, no one seems to be that bothered by it, to the point that I could slaughter half the population and people would still be expecting me to defeat the big villain and save the world, then act all surprised when I decide to join him instead. Eventually I got to the final boss, who didn't hold still long enough for my stupidly overpowered dark spell to be effective, so all I could do was whack it repeatedly over the head with my sword while it chewed constantly on my lower body. But I had so many health potions by that point that I could basically drip-feed myself with the stuff, and after the boss popped its scaly clogs, I still had enough left over to throw a health potion keg party. In conclusion, Fable is at its heart a fairly decent action RPG, and if they just spent more time ironing out the balance issues and keeping Peter Molyneux's gob shut during development, then it would probably have been more favourably received. But the game's big selling point is also its biggest flaw. In trying to as choice it tries to do too much and ultimately collapses under its own weight. Personally, I don't think there's anything inherently bad about linearity in games, but it seems that saying your game will be non-linear will make people jump all over it like you've said it gives you free blowjobs and pudding. At the end of July, a demo of the PS3 exclusive Hacky Slashy Mamathon Heavenly Sword by developers Ninja Theory was released on the PS3 online marketplace Thing. The game is loftily described as not merely a game but a martial arts drama in the guise of a game, but enough quoting from the Wikipedia page, let's see what the demo has to show for itself. The game, sorry, martial arts drama is named after the weapon wielded by the main character, extremely western looking woman with extremely Japanese sounding name du jour Nariko, although if you look closely you'll notice that most of the time the Heavenly Sword is actually two swords, plural, perhaps because the developers felt they weren't being enough like God of War. Nariko certainly wears roughly the same amount of clothing as Kratos in that she's one protruding nail away from a Boris Vallejo painting, but after that the developers seem to go out of their way to defy the comparison. Kratos possessed no hair and a Y chromosome, Nariko has no Y chromosome and hair growing out to about 8 feet long, which flows jerkily behind her like a rope made out of dry tagliatelle. The whole effect does not so much scream battle hardened swordswoman as it does the phrase try and pull this one off cosplayers. Anyway, the Heavenly Swords demo uses the bold storytelling technique known as telling us bugger all and throws us right into the game in medias res. We see Nariko standing on a cliff looking down upon some prime riverside property soliloquizing some motivation concerning her father and revenge and how the place below her is full of evil dudes she intends to slit up. Of course at this point we only have her word for that, for all we know it's actually a puppy obedience school with an unusually large security detail, but what the hell, okay. Nariko then turns to some... thing, sitting vacantly nearby wearing cat ears and makeup apparently applied by a KISS fan with Parkinson's disease and relays to it her intention to slit up evil dudes. She then adds, with a totally straight face, We may need you to play Twing Twang. My first thought when I heard that was I am so going to quote that out of context, but on reflection it doesn't make a whole lot of sense in context either. If the developers were hoping I'd consider buying the full game just to see what Twing Twang is, then mission fucking accomplished I suppose, but I'm going to be very disappointed if it isn't a cutesy euphemism for lesbian cunnilingus, yeah I went there. Moving on, our first taste of interactivity comes as we walk Nariko up to a support rope and press X when the game invites us to, at which point she starts running along it towards the compound, and the God of War comparisons return like a half brick to the skull when the game has us do the whole button mashing reflex tester thing. I follow the game's orders like a well trained West Highland Terrier and end up on a narrow rocky spire that despite its height and remoteness is judged strategically important enough to have an entire regiment standing on it, and so I have to stop mocking the game for pointless nitpicks and move on to the make or break part of a fighting game, the combat. Nariko is swiftly surrounded on all sides by about 10 million guards, so I immediately leap into action and mash random buttons on the controller as fast as I can. I didn't really have much of a strategy in mind, but it seemed that Nariko was interpreting my button pressing as more of a helpful suggestion than an order anyway. She jumps around with her underdressed, undernourished form, spinning all over the place like a bunch of coat hangers in a dryer, but the attacks feel laborious and it seems to take a lot of blows to bring down each individual enemy, especially when the guys with big hats show up who block nearly every move. Once or twice the game took control to show Nariko doing a quick fatality move on some poor twits, but the moments when she did this didn't seem to have any particular connection to the buttons I was mashing at the time. At this point the only drama in this martial arts drama was whether or not I was going to be able to finish off the crowd before my thumbs fell off. Eventually I'd killed everyone on the big tall spire, and since Nariko wasn't quite finished expressing her death wish, she then cut the support ropes that held up the big stone erection and rode it down to the ground where it collapsed upon a bunch of soldiers who were doing manly things like arm wrestling and grunting. And if you're seeing a sort of Freundian motif going on here then rest assured you're not the only one. Another armed horde falls upon Nariko and another less precarious battle takes place, and as soon as it's over the demo ends. That's all there is. It's difficult to tell with a demo this short, but somehow I don't feel that Heavenly Swords is going to light the world on fire or be the kind of exclusive title the PS3 needs right now. It's difficult to have faith in a developer that feels the optimum amount of gameplay time for a demo is barely enough to boil an egg. It's so short that I'm left with nothing else to say about it. So let's talk about the Resident Evil 5 trailer instead. 
The video depicts a white as the driven snow main character from a previous Resident Evil game, in this case Chris Redfield, who has apparently been making an income on the side, smuggling cantaloupe melons in his upper arms, entering an obviously foreign and tangibly dirty peasant village and getting attacked by a scythe and pitchfork wielding mob of bewitched locals. And if this sounds familiar to you, then you've probably played Resident Evil 4, which also began with a white as the driven snow main character from a previous Resident Evil game entering obviously foreign and tangibly dirty, etc, etc. I wasn't really expecting them to deviate too much from a format that has proved wildly successful, but Jesus Christ guys, you could at least try to mix it up. Judging by the gameplay shown in the trailer, that too hasn't changed much, and they're still maintaining the fine Resident Evil tradition of dialogue written by a 12-year-old ADD sufferer locked in a room with a pile of Buffy the Vampire Slayer comic books. But I guess I've danced around the major issue long enough, so let's talk about the hot spicy racism. Capcom have rather shot themselves in the foot by having the peasants this time around being African, thus prompting the inevitable demented honking from the politically correct. In an admittedly weak defense of Capcom, Resident Evil 4 wasn't any less racist, really, what with all the Spaniard murdering and characters unironically using the expression ay ay ay, but poverty-stricken Africans are a somewhat different kettle of fish to greasy mainland Europeans. Still, the games are, after all, made by the Japanese, and everyone knows what a bunch of xenophobic dicks they are. Part of me feels that from an artistic standpoint there may be some merit in RE5, because the point of a horror game is to be unnerving, and forcing the player to do something they find distasteful as well as frightening is a rather groundbreaking method of doing that. But then again, this is Resident Evil, the series that brought a squeaky-voiced midget Napoleon, and if there's anything sophisticated in an idea of theirs, it's probably a total accident. There tends to be a knee-jerk reaction to perceived racism these days, regardless of intent or irony, and I don't think we need to start worrying about RE5 until they break out the fried chicken. I want you to take part in a little practical demonstration for me. I want you to find a pen or some other similarly dimensioned object in the Cheeto-scented detritus surrounding your computer keyboard. Pause the video and get one. Seriously, do it. Don't keep watching waiting to see where I'm going with this, just do it. Right. Once you've got one, insert it between the second and third fingers of one of your hands, as shown. Now when I'm finished talking, pause the video again and use your other hand to squeeze your fingers inwards towards the pen. You may have noticed that this really fucking hurts and that you are now in a great amount of pain. Congratulations, you have just received your punishment for not buying Psychonauts. I'd like to know how you think gaming is ever going to adapt as an art form and people go out of their way to make original games but fuckwits like you never actually buy them because they're too busy inhaling furious amounts of dick. If you did buy Psychonauts, please disregard the preceding. The mind behind Psychonauts belongs to Tim Schafer, a luminary of LucasArts in the days when LucasArts was the foremost developer of clever, smart, funny adventure games like Monkey Island and Day of the Tentacle before LucasArts decided to axe the cleverness division in favour of the milking the Star Wars license until its udders turned into little black stalactites department. So while LucasArts dedicated themselves to fondling George Lucas improperly for the rest of his life, the jobless members of the cleverness division went out and founded new companies, one of which was Tim Schafer's Double Vine Productions, whose first release was Psychonauts. The story goes that while working on full throttle for LucasArts, Schafer envisioned a sequence wherein the main character underwent a peyote fueled psychological dream subconscious journey thing, but the bigwigs rejected the idea because it wasn't family friendly enough. Incidentally, the released Full Throttle featured hardcore biker gangs, bludgeoning murder, and more than one person getting chainsawed in the face, so perhaps this was the early warning sign that LucasArts bigwigs are all a bunch of chimps with Down syndrome. But that idea festered and eventually blossomed into Psychonauts, and because no one buys adventure games anymore since the stupid virus epidemic of the late 90s, it was made into one of those hard to classify games that usually get uninformatively termed an action adventure by the Invisible Pigeonholing Council. One of the themes running through Schaefer's humour is the juxtaposition of a mundane situation in a bizarre or fantastical setting, see Grim Fandango, and Psychonauts continues this tradition by being set in a summer camp for psychics. The story follows the adventures of Raz, a child acrobat who in deference to tradition runs away from home to escape the circus rather than join it, and whose natural psychic talent allows him to insinuate himself into the camp without paying tuition fees. Shortly, however, karma bites him in the arse when he finds himself embroiled in a sinister plot and having to explore strange ethereal worlds based on the subconscious minds of those around him. It's all kind of like if Tim Burton knocked up David Lynch and Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory and he did meth right up until the birth. Psychonaut seems like a rather polarising game in that some people seem to think it's the kind of thing Jesus would make if he was alive and wasn't a pussy, and some other people feel it's a chunky vomit milkshake severely overhyped by the people in Party A. Which group you'll fall into depends on whether you're the kind of misty-eyed, games are art hippie who can allow things like excellent storytelling and charming artistic direction excuse a few gameplay issues, or if you're the kind of twitching, right in popping Xbox owner who falls into a narcoleptic coma when they go without killing something for 45 seconds. There are gameplay issues indeed, in embracing action platform adventure bollocks, this is Schaefer's first attempt at any genre other than adventure, unless you count the god-awful combat sequence in full throttle and the inexperienced shows. The platforming handles a bit dodgily at times, the side quests are all just scavenger hunts at various levels of unfairness, the combat is meh, and it has a really weird difficulty curve. Virtually the entire first half of the game consists of training missions, and towards the very end, difficulty suddenly jumps like you found a tarantula under its toilet seat, and the last few levels are exercises in control of snapping frustration. But I obviously like the game, or I wouldn't have made you cripple yourself at the start of this review, so let's move on to the 
good bits. It's tempting just to write everything else and knock off for lunch, but I like to think I'm more professional than that, so here goes. Firstly, it's something original in an industry that seems to be built on ripping off everyone else. Secondly, it's genuinely funny, while most video games attempting humour are like unanesthetised bowel surgery. Thirdly, every single character is well defined with their own quirks and personalities, even the tiny unimportant bit part players that get less screen time than Christopher Lee in the last Lord of the Rings film. And lastly, it's fun. Remember that, fun, what we used to have before gaming felt like a second job. I'm just going to list out of context some of the things that occur in Psychonauts. A telekinetic bear. A dentist who harvests brains. A sequence wherein you become a giant Godzilla-style monster and terrorise a society of talking fish. And a shadowy trench-coated government agent who disguises himself as a housewife by brandishing a rolling pin and talking disjointedly about pies. A game that features all of these things simply cannot be criticised. It's against the law or something. Psychonauts was released on every console that matters, and the PC version is available on Steam now, so your next course of action should probably be to buy it if you haven't already. I like to think we're not all so jaded that we can let a few handling issues ruin our enjoyment of a game that allows you to set squirrels on fire, so stop whining and just enjoy it for what it is, you craven douche. We're currently living in the seventh generation of consoles, if Wikipedia is to be believed. Seven generations of feuding and inbreeding like the residents of some backwards Louisiana swamp, and this is around the time the really interesting deformities start setting in. So while we're on the subject, let's start with the Wii. Nintendo is the oldest contestant still in the console race, and it seems they've gotten bored of the usual brick with button pads attached with string model, and are trying to mix things up with a fancy motion-sensitive system of controls. A bold effort perhaps to do away with the grind of random button mashing, but in practice it's really only replacing it with random stick waggling. It's almost like we've come full circle back to the joystick waggling of the Spectrum and C6 era, and now I feel really old, but if the Wii's controller is supposed to be a universal motion sensor, then why do they keep bringing out attachments to turn the thing into a steering wheel, or gun, or guitar, or milking machine, or something? Somehow I liked it better when it was asking us to fill in the blanks with the power of imagination. That had a sort of charming Muppet Baby's innocence to it. The Wii's game lineup consists of the usual Nintendo staples of Zelda, Metroid, Mario, etc., because Nintendo's policy seems to be that if you beat a dead horse vigorously enough, its constant twitching and juddering will at least give a semblance of activity, but of the big sellers, only Zelda is currently out, and the rest of the available games are a cavalcade of mediocrity. As overused as the character is, it seems that a Nintendo console on the market without a Mario title is like a fat kid swimming without water wings. The polar opposite to Nintendo's bewilderingly named, modestly powered little white cuboid is Sony's unoriginally titled monolithic black colossus, the PlayStation 3, a shiny chrome Spider-Man typefaced thing the size of a small car loaded with arguably the most powerful top-of-the-range hardware. But blinging out your console with such things creates the unspoken obligation to also bling out the games with top-of-the-range graphics, which puts production time and costs several months and several million dollars on the side of uncomfortable. This may explain why there are hardly any games out for the bloody Thing. Like Nintendo, the PS3 is largely selling on future potential because of the promise of Metal Gear Solid 4 and Final Fantasy 13 at some point, but if Final Fantasy 13 continues the tradition of most new Final Fantasies, then you could probably simulate it just as well by listening to the Star Wars soundtrack while huffing nitrous oxide and reading an Excel spreadsheet. But it's okay, because Sony are marketing this overpriced horse box as not only a games machine, but also a player of Blu-ray movies, which is apparently some new format that's better than DVD. It's supposed to have higher definition, but personally I've never found myself saying, oh, Army of Darkness is still a glorious celebration of boyish fantasy violence, but if only the rest resolution was a wee bit bigger, it could be significantly improved. I'm not a connoisseur, but for me there's really not enough visible difference between Blu-ray and DVD quality for Sony to credibly argue that it's the next big advance. And let's not forget that combining a home gaming system with a movie system is something that Sony tried with the PSP, and failed at because no one wanted to buy Full Metal Jacket again just for the privilege of watching it on the bus in teeny weeny eye strain vision While Sony targets hardcore technology freaks, and Nintendo targets gamers who aren't yet old enough to cross the road by themselves, the Xbox 360 has its sights on more of a casual gaming beer drinking frat boy demographic and reflects that with a stack of big tough manly games like Gears of War and Dead Rising, the latter being a game with a difficulty curve like running headlong into a brick wall. The 360 undoubtedly has the strongest lineup of games, which at this point is admittedly like beating two quadruple amputees at swing ball, because it also has a strong back catalogue of Xbox games, or at least it would do if the backwards compatibility wasn't a big load of bullshit and chips. The 360 also has the best online support for the Xbox Live malarkey, although the player base can charitably be described as lively, and uncharitably described as a bunch of hooting dickholes. And then of course there's the fact that the 360 hardware has a bad case of the Gremlins. A time of writing, the 360 in my household is bricked because we had the sheer gall to try and play games on it. It seemed to recover for a while after some fiddling, but after that though we were afraid to use it in case it returned to the land of the dead. For a few days it was like Schrodinger's console in a quantum state of both bricked and unbricked until we finally tried playing something again and the waveform collapsed. So it's currently at the repair shop. Perhaps next month I will have to review Halo 3 by playing it on a microwave. With the current generation of consoles, we've reached or nearly reached the point where graphics aren't going to get much better, so we can all stop rushing to top the last generation's technology and concentrate on making some games with actual depth. Except, of course, that the console wars are all ultimately futile because the best game ever, Fantasy World Dizzy for the Commodore 64, has already been made. Or maybe all of gaming is pointless, just toying with the gravel on the side of the big road of life. But hey, at least there's violence and tits.
If my Psychonauts review taught me anything, it's that nobody likes me when I'm being nice to a game, so let me quickly get the praise for Bioshock out of the way first. It's incredibly good looking, but then what isn't these days? Brilliantly written, masterfully atmospheric, and resoundingly imaginative, even if thematically it has at best taken a few pointers from Fallout and at worst held it down and bloodily ripped it off. And even considering all the horrible things I'm about to say, it's probably still one of the best games of the year. Right, that's that over with, let's talk shittiness. Bioshock is billed as a spiritual successor to System Shock 2, and I'm sure System Shock 2 will be very proud of its normal mapped fong shaded bastard child because it takes after its daddy almost to the degree of George Bush. And I know what you're going to say, Yahtzee you charismatic stallion. What kind of complaint is that? System Shock 2 was brilliant and any game that's in any way like it should be equally good. But that's the thing, it isn't like System Shock 2, it is System Shock 2. Oh sure, it looks different and it differs in the fine detailing and the character names are changed and shit, but once you strip all that out, the bad guy might as well just be Showdown with a waistcoat and a copy of Atlas Shrugged. The Psy powers are now plasmids, the hybrids are now splice and the wrench is now, well, a wrench, but it's a different kind of wrench. Everything that was cyberpunk then is steampunk now, and sometimes it gets a little bit hard to swallow. How exactly does a steam-powered gun turret differentiate between friend and foe? I wasn't aware that boiled water could form allegiances. The audio logs and ghost sequences return, because obviously we all love sitting like a lemon listening to exposition when jabbering Depression-era mutants are on the prowl. It even pulls the same side-tracking shit System Shock 2 did. Every time you get a deceptively simple objective like walk across the room, you can bet your bionic implants that a door's gonna lock or the ceiling's gonna collapse, and you'll have to journey to Mount Doom and back just to restore the status quo. Which is not to say it copies the gameplay of System Shock 2 exactly. Quite a few elements have been removed, presumably to dumb it down for the console tards. There's no inventory screen, so you can't easily check on what you're carrying, and every time you pick up filth-encrusted food or drink items off the floor, you scarf them right down where you stand like you've got some kind of wasting illness. And this FPS RPG hardly has any RPG elements. Your character can use every gun and every plasmid and can hack anything he likes from the word go. The only specialisation comes from equipable tonics, but you get enough slots to pretty much beef yourself up in every area. And hacking, or should I say plumbing, has no cost and is pretty much piss easy right to the end as long as you have two functioning limbs. Cameras are sometimes a bit hard to reach, but if you jump and hit the hack button when it comes into range, then you'll remain floating in mid-air while you work, and any enemies who happen to be around obligingly wait for you to finish up before resuming the murder. System Shock 2's difficulty fell somewhere between challenging and murderous, so perhaps a little scaling back in that area was desirable, but Bioshock reaches the target and keeps going about 10 million yards too far. You basically trip over ammo, money and medkits everywhere you go, the life restoration chambers are back, but now there's no cost to use them and there's one every 10 feet, so dying becomes more of a momentary annoyance. And once you realise that there's no reason to be careful, nothing really poses a threat anymore, and the game ceases to be scary or difficult in the slightest. In order to build up your character, you need to gather cybernetic mod- sorry, Adam, a mysterious compound that can only be acquired by doing dreadful things to little girls, and this is the crux of the game's touted moral choice system. But there are only two endings, a good one and a bad one, and the extreme contrast between them is rather jarring. In the good ending, you're a virtuous flower child with love and a smile for all the shiny-coated beasts of God's kingdom, and in the bad ending, you're some kind of hybrid of Hitler and Skeletor, whose very piss is pure liquid malevolence. I'm sick of games that claim to have choice but that only really come down to either Mother Teresa or baby eating. All I'm saying is that a little middle ground is nice now and then. Maybe it's because my heart is a dried up little rotten apple of cynicism but when a game gets overhyped it's more likely to make me suspicious than excited so I was mentally prepared for Bioshock not living up to the claims that it would descend from heaven in a silvery chariot and lead us to the promised land. Which is not to say that it's bad, it's just shallower than was advertised. I suppose if you got the Xbox version and are used to insipid boom fests like Halo then Bioshock will seem like the shits but if you're a long time PC gamer spoiled by more complex FPS RPGs then you're in for a kick in the balls. Maybe a gentler kick in the balls than most, an extremely pretty, well-executed kick in the balls with the best of intentions, but at the end of the day is still walking funny. In reviewing Tomb Raider Anniversary, I feel a strong temptation to rely on cheap laughs, but since I always strive to challenge myself, I've decided to solemnly vow to get through this entire review without making any reference to female breasts. So with that in mind, let's get rolling. The original Tomb Raiders were made by British developers Core Design, but after a while they weren't exactly treating the old girl properly. They basically just made the same game six times, with each setting introducing broader and broader definitions of the word tomb. And the series practically died with Angel of Darkness, but the publishers weren't prepared to let something so popular with sweaty 13-year-old boys with holes in their pockets die, so they handed it over to some cheese burger inhaling yanks who announced their intention to remake the first game and do it properly, which as insults go is right up there with slapping you in the balls with your own dead dog. Maybe it's just me, but the developer transition seems to have brought about a few changes in Lara. For example, in the original intro for Tomb Raider she responds to the advances of a big lumpy Texan vaguely flirtatiously, while in the new one she has the bog standard Hollywood tough gal coldness and threats of violence because everyone knows action oriented independent women all munch more carpet than a malfunctioning vacuum cleaner. For the most part though it's pretty much a straight port of the old levels with some extra puzzles to show off the new moves in Lara's repertoire, most of which she probably picked up from the tombs of the Persian royal family if you see what I mean. But don't panic fans of the original because Crystal Dynamics have faithfully continued the tradition of having Lara handle like a cow in a supermarket trolley. Oh yes, Lara was no stranger to the five story splatter death on this adventure. Half the time I'd take a running jump off a platform only to discover too late that I was a few degrees off and could only watch helplessly as Lara ragdollized on jagged rocks. The other half of the time the game engine stubbornly refused to register Lara's grip on the next ledge and another unscheduled trip to jagged rocks country would ensue. It came to the point that I actually became rather glad whenever it happened because I was enjoying seeing Lara 
received just punishment for not following my instructions properly. Part of the problem is the camera, which never seems to be pointing at what I wanted to point at, resulting in what I like to call leap of faith gameplay. The camera seems to be constantly swinging around into the best angle to show off Lara's physique, leaving you pushing forward when you had been pushing left and taking another wrong turn at Jagged Rock Junction. The reason for this seems to be a cynical emphasis on pandering to the aforementioned 13-year-old pocket mining demographic. If you leave her for a while, Lara does these shamefully erotic stretches and whenever she comes out of water she's realistically wet and glistening. It kind of takes me back to when I was 15 and playing the original Tomb Raider and I'd back her up into a corner to get the best view of her juicy thighs. The combat's also been upgraded for modern times, and by that I mean they've chucked in the tired old God of War Simon Says button matching sequences which every action game has to have now by law. And someone on the design team, you know who you are, thought it would be a great idea to have the player constantly press R1 to fire repeatedly rather than just hold it down. But the R1 button is not positioned for comfortable mashing, and when you go up against enemies who can take 10 million bullets before dying, like say for example most of them, then your fingers cramp up like you're playing Guitar Hero but without the nebbish Rockstar fantasy. I could keep lashing the game for all kinds of stuff, but I'm judgmentally biased against it because it's a remake and I think remakes are bloody stupid. It's just futile money spinning for the terminally unimaginative, but unnecessary remaking is becoming inexplicably popular and it's not just happening to old stuff anymore. I'm given to understand that Vin Diesel is planning to remake Escape from Butcher Bay. I have stuff in my CRISPR drawer that's older than that game. I mean, is it just because no one can come up with new ideas? It's not hard. Here's one. A genetically engineered Taiwanese chef teams up with a Newton Affairs to rescue his large-bosomed girlfriend from mummies. There, you see? It's easy. A breast cancer specialist with large bosoms journeys through time to pay for a breast enlargement. A race of bosom people set out on an armada of bosoms to find a new bosom homeworld. Bosoms, melons, milk factories, busts, fun bags, knockers, bally, steaks, boobies, jugs, nipples, jubblies, stonking great tits. Controversy and the games industry go hand in hand like Ico and Yorda, if you'll forgive the incredibly nerdy analogy. And like Yorda, the controversy tends to stay focused for an average of about 8 nanoseconds before getting bored and drifting off to do something else. But when it does get focused, it can get very exasperating, such as when youthful paragons of self control are called nasty names and decide that murder would be the wittiest comeback, and then is found to have stood next to a video game at some point in the past. Then the media generally start drooling the usual uninformed questions as to whether wholesome boyish pretend violence has any correlation with the real world. Short answer, no. Long answer, no, and go fuck yourselves, you ignorant, scaremongering cock bags, but sometimes this can be a difficult position to take. Okay, pressing buttons to shoot guns in, say, Soldier of Fortune is about as far removed from the workings of actual guns as my ass is from the dark side of Europa, but then you have games like Manhunt, which not only have the player viciously maim human beings with a variety of household objects, but also provides detailed and up-close demonstrations on how to achieve the most horrific results, and arguing the harmlessness of it all lacks credibility somewhat. Manhunt comes courtesy of Rockstar North, best known for Whirligig Give It Responsibility Grand Theft Auto, and concerns the adventures of the laughably named James Earl Cash, who is plucked from death row in order to take part in a snuff film for the pleasure of some unseen but mouthy pervert. So off he goes to shoot, garrot, bludgeon, slash and plastic bag his way through legions of his fellow man. First impressions were bad. Let's get something straight, alright, the third person action game developers? Left analogue stick for movement, right analogue stick to rotate camera around player. How is it that when you see something that works perfectly well you immediately decide to try and improve it and cock the whole thing up? In Manhunt, the right analogue stick changes to the first person camera, which may seem reasonable in theory, but it means that when you're hiding and trying to see a nearby guard patrolling behind you, you nudge the stick and end up staring at a brick wall. And half the time, when you finally rest all the camera into the right angle, you'll see the guard has patrolled right up to you and has now shivved you in the bollocks. There are other things I can complain about, like how the whole smack a wall to lure over a guard, then do dreadful things to them with the nearest sharp object rigmarole repeats itself verbatim for virtually every single enemy, but after I'd played for a couple of hours, a strange thing happened. I was actually having fun. I know, it was a weird and frightening realisation. You see, I've always had a fondness of Jason films, because I hate 80s fashion trends and it's nice to see people being punished for them, and Manhunt felt kind of like being in a Jason film, I guess, except it was more like the logical opposite of a Jason film in that I was a desperate, terrified normal guy stalking and dispatching droves of masked psychotics. Sadly, the fun dried up as I got further through the game and the emphasis shifted from stealth to gunplay like every action game and their dog. There's a tendency for stealth games to try and have their cake and eat it by including action-heavy combat segments, see also Thief the Dark Project, and it almost always means a trip to shitty town. Manhunt expected me to clear out a building full of bad guys, then kill a boss from long distance with a motherfucking shotgun, all in the space of a two-minute timer. To paraphrase Oscar Wilde, no chance, you unreasonable dicks. Manhunt has actually been banned in this country because the Australian government has this habit of trying pathetically hard to jump onto bandwagon issues that roll in from real countries, but I seriously don't know whose side to be on when it comes to the debate of whether games like Manhunt mess with the heads of underage impressionable thickies. There's a very clear certification indicating that 12 year olds aren't supposed to be playing it, but there's no denying that they play it anyway because no one other than 12 year olds are into this sort of thing. Gushing breathlessly about garrot wire decapitation and baseball bat cranial explosion is a good way to win friends in middle school, but around the office water cooler it's a good way to lose them. When you break it down, Manhunt is a game that doesn't excel, but is at least competent in most areas and it's good for relieving tension, which is really all you can ask for. It only stands out in the area of juvenile gore, so take this as a recommendation if you're the kind of person who needs to see a gushing mangled neck stump before they can get it up. 
I hope you won't mind if I put on my new games journalism hat for a moment, but I was pretty thrown when my editor asked me to review Peggle. Peggle is one of the new breed of casual games, and like most casual games there's not a lot you can say about it. Unlike normal games there isn't any dreadful voice acting or inevitable sewer level to take the piss out of. What I can say about it is that I started playing it around noon and emerged from my room sometime later to find that the authorities had declared me legally dead. If the whole casual gaming thing has slipped you by, then allow me to hold your face under the putrescent waters of knowledge. At some point in the recent past someone noticed that simple flash-based 2D colour matching games like Bejeweled were making frankly embarrassing amounts of dosh, and the reason for this is that as time has gone by, bored housewives stuck at home have all independently decided that shagging the TV repairman is no longer appropriate and have turned to video games to amuse themselves instead. I'm going to go out on a limb here and presume that you, the viewer, have had a mother at some point, and you may at some point have seen her attempt to play a mainstream video game. In most cases this is like watching a cat trying to fly a kite, so it's easy to understand why this new demographic of gamers has exploded the popularity of uncomplicated, easily picked up games for old people and stupids. Peggle is a game by PopCap, PopCap being the biggest developer and distributor of casual games, and basically plays like a combination of pinball and breakout dressed up with bright colours, an impressive soundtrack and animal mascots dripping with insincere cuteness. Basically you have to hit a certain amount of pegs with a limited number of balls while getting help from power-ups ranging from very helpful to profound waste of time. Like with pinball, the game keeps talking about skill, but is mostly about luck, because elementary chaos theory makes it virtually impossible to predict where a ball is going to go beyond maybe the first two ricochets unless you've got a degree in geometry from the University of Smart Arse. There are about about, ooh, 130 odd levels of incremental difficulty, and after you beat them all you get a graphic of a nice trophy. In summary, it's okay I guess, I preferred bookworm adventures, but then I'm one of those hopeless mutants who genuinely enjoys playing Scrabble. That's it, that's about as far as I can review Peggle because that's the entire extent of the game. I don't know what PopCap's mission statement is, but I'm betting that it's something along the lines of use pretty sparkly lights, encouraging sound effects, and as few gameplay elements as possible to make the gaming equivalent of premium crack cocaine. And it seems to be working for them because they are now worth umpteen millions. MILLIONS! They exclusively make cheapo 2D games, what the hell do they spend all that money on, ice cream? Some people think that all this is killing the mainstream gaming industry because why the hell would anyone want to make a murderously complex top of the range title with full 3D up the arse when they could make just as much with a 2D game about catapults flicking balls at coloured squares, but I don't support that point of view. PopCap's success isn't really hurting the mainstream gaming industry, but I will say this, it could very well be hurting the casual gaming industry. You see, with their less complexity and lower production costs, casual games are an ideal starting point for new developers to get their name out and some cash flow going, but PopCap's big sacks of cash make it easy for them to buy the best talent and come up with more and more relentlessly addictive ball bouncer thorns that overshadow everyone else's efforts. It's unfair, isn't it? Once your funding hits the seventh digit, you're supposed to start making Gun Battle Slap Fight 37 for the PlayStation 12 and leave the colour matching tile puzzles to the bedroom programmers. Don't be fooled by the adorable fluffy animal facade PopCap's games erect. Inside they're a ruthless bunch. If this were an 80s sports movie, PopCap and the other large casual game developers would be the evil team, the snotty fabulously rich kids with tailored uniforms, the ones the shabby underdog heroes have to beat in the film's conclusion in their narrow but heartwarming victory. Sorry, this is getting a bit tangential. Peggle then. I wouldn't say I like it, in the same way that an alcoholic doesn't usually claim to like alcohol, but it's a handy little time waster when you're trying to put off writing a review. And if you're a husband, you could buy a copy for your housebound wife, then maybe she'll stop badgering you for sex. It seems that all the other game reviewers in the world have put me in an awkward position, bunch of cock eaters to a man as they are. Most, if not all of them, seem to have played a jewel-encrusted golden gift from the treasure vaults of Xerxes, but I played a game that I'd probably only have considered renting if it weren't for those suckers at the escapist paying for all my games now. Part of the problem may be that I'd never actually played a Halo game until this one, maybe you need all the backstory to get the experience all the other reviewers were apparently having, or maybe Microsoft was paying someone to stand behind them jamming needles full of dopamine into their spinal columns every half hour. All I knew going into the game was this, there's some guy called Master Chief who constantly wears a suit of armour that's probably in dire need of some odour eaters by this point, and this series is apparently so good that Xbox owners have been tossing each other off with glee in anticipation for this third instalment. I picked up a few things on the way through the game, like how the Earth has been conquered by evil aliens, only some of the aliens are good by some arbitrary designation, and there are these other aliens who are basically just the headcrabs from Half-Life in disguise, and there are big rings in space that make things die somehow, and Master Chief has a friend who is basically the black guy from Predator. But I gave up following the plot around the time I was in a base being ordered around by a 12 year old girl, and pretty much remained in the dark from then on, which is an ironic choice of words considering that the lighting engine constantly vomits brightly coloured bloom into your face. If you ask me to summarise Halo 3 in one word, I'd tell you to stop being such a twat, but if pressed I guess I'd go for schizophrenic. It can't seem to decide on a tone, at times it goes the horror route with the aforementioned headcrab malarkey, but at other times you've got enemy midgets running around sounding and acting like retarded Ewoks making finger quotes wacky dialogue, and it's hard to take things seriously when most of the guns look and sound like they were manufactured by Mattel. The difficulty is also rather inconsistent, which probably comes from the design team being large enough to found a small island nation. The difficulty curve wavers up and down like the knickers of an indecisive whore before plunging dramatically into a sun 
Sunday stroll down Easy Street for the last hour or so. There were sequences really near the beginning that kicked my ass until I was wearing my buttocks like a hat, while the closest thing to a final boss fight is basically you versus a wheelchair-bound cross-eyed hobbit and you're armed with the BFG 9000. One thing I did like was the vehicle sections and being able to choose whether you drive, man the turret, or just ride shotgun and wave to passing chicks while the friendly NPCs take all the other roles. It's great in theory. Unfortunately, it's let down by the NPCs all being pants on head retarded. On one occasion it was my jeep versus an enemy tank, but the clueless pillock at the turret seemed more interested in shooting down nearby butterflies. Eventually I got out and took the turret myself, ordering my passenger to take the driver's seat, whereupon he immediately drove a smack into a wall and sat there picking his nose while the enemy leisurely blew us to Narnia. As well as being blighted by the above issues, the single player campaign is criminally short, maybe 8-10 to ten hours depending on difficulty setting and individual ham-handedness, but people have been telling me that the multiplayer excuses it. Unfortunately I don't give a flying shit about multiplayer and neither do a lot of people. I didn't pay, I mean the escapist didn't pay $100 Australian for a game that's only half decent, especially not one at whose feet reviewers have been throwing perfect scores like bunches of roses to a bullfighter. A game that is supposed to be perfect wouldn't need anything to excuse it. Quad erat demonstrandum, said Yati, like the big literary fag that he is. Before all the Microsoft fanboys come to my house and take it in turns to whittle through my letterbox, let me qualify my statements by saying that Halo 3 is by no means bad. What it is is average. Boilerplate. Run of the mill. A competent shooter, its only remarkable feature being the degree to which it's stuck up its own ass. Everything it does has been done before and better. It's definitely not as good as Bioshock. In fact, it's made me look back on those 15 hours of objectivist folder roll more charitably, so in other words, Halo 3 is what it took to finally make me lower my standards and I hope it's proud of itself. But really, I don't know what I hope to achieve with all this. Halo 3 is already more popular than God, and nothing I can say is going to stop Microsoft making enough money to buy Switzerland and reinforce the notion that all gamers want is brightly coloured dross with the depth of a spoon. So if in the future we all find ourselves playing Captain Bland's monotonous adventure in what moments we can spare between toiling in the Microsoft Overmind's off-world mining complex, then I want you to know that I fucking called it. Tabula rasa is a Latin term meaning blank slate, and generally refers to the school of thought stating that humans are born with no inherent programming. For example, Richard Garriott is an utterly demented games designer who wears a crown and insists that people call him Lord British, but was he born with the galloping crazies, or was it a lack of appropriate social contact that caused him to descend permanently into an insane fantasy world? Lord Garriott's previous games include, and by that I mean consist entirely of, the Ultima series, a bunch of needlessly obtuse fantasy RPGs in which his author insertion fantasy persona sets another of his author insertion fantasy personas on various divine quests to prove their awesomeness while being assisted on all sides by two or three additional author insertion fantasy personas. Of late, though, he's promoted his fantasy persona to the rank of General British and author inserted himself into his new memorpaga Tabula Rasa, the beta for which the escapist parachuted me into for a week. Things got off to a flying start on the character creation screen when I discovered that I could choose the colour of my starting armour, so I immediately kitted myself out with an ensemble of a fluorescent pink and a matching Ace Ventura hairdo. Then, mindful of the fact that the duty of a beta tester was to try and break the game, I decided to test out Tabula Rasa's obscenity filter by naming my creation Gareth Gobblecock. Now, I usually avoid online RPGs because I think they're all a bunch of pointless time sinks for socially maladjusted freaks with self diagnosed diagnosed Asperger's Syndrome, but I'm happy to say that Tabula Rasa caused this policy of mine to completely stay exactly the same. A few good yonks ago I played World of Warcraft for a while because I acquired three months of free playtime. I'd never actually pay for this kind of crap because even if I did somehow desperately need to lose money I'd just throw it off a bridge. But anyway, I begrudgingly felt that World of Warcraft is about as good as MMOs are ever going to get, and I suspect that Richard Garriott feels the same way because the Tabula Rasa user interface looks a hell of a lot like the one for World of Warcraft, just with a sci-fi theme added and the user friendliness scaled back to minus 92. My roommate tells me that Tabula Rasa is supposed to be a new kind of online RPG that has less of the repetitive grind that blights other MMOs. I suspect he was thinking of some other game though, because Tabula Rasa is grind-tastic. No sooner had Gareth minced into the first world than he was given a series of quests to kill specific numbers of local wildlife X, Y, and Z in return for new, slightly better guns and armour, which swiftly replaced all of my starting armour, destroying Gareth's individuality and raising the question of why they let me choose custom colours in the first place, and so began a typical MMO experience, i.e. doing the same thing a hundred times. Tabula Rasa's touted innovation comes from the fact that it attempts to blend elements of online shooters seamlessly with the standard RPG questing shenanigans. Enemy NPCs you see, constantly warp in and attempt to seize friendly settlements, necessitating that they be defended or retaken before the settlement can be used for quests and shopping, creating this sort of territory control element. But the thing is, people who like Memorpagas and people who like online shooters don't overlap much. MMORPGs tend to be more intelligent. Okay, I can't finish that sentence with a straight face. Alright, so they're a lot slower paced compared to your average Counter-Strike player's foamy mouth gibbering daily life, and in this game the shooter enthusiast is going to be pissed off by all the roundabout levelling up tomfoolery, while the RPG enthusiast is going to be pissed off when they come back to base to finish a quest and find that it is now an evil alien self-service restaurant. To me it all smacks of a typical problem in the media in that rather than focusing on pleasing a particular audience, designers try to please as many people as possible and just end up giving a blanketly mediocre experience for all. So what exactly am I saying? Well, don't fix what isn't broke, I suppose. Taking a format that has proved a massive success and gluing on extra bits rarely causes the coveted lightning to strike twice. Talking about removing grind from MMOs is all very well until you think about it, because grind is the only thing that keeps people playing MMOs for so long, and removing it will be like removing the crazy from Richard Garriott. Besides, every MMO so far has a grind right up the bum and it doesn't seem to stop 
people playing them. Some people just like that sort of thing, I guess. Some people also find fat people sexy. I don't understand them myself, but then most people don't understand why I like putting lettuce around my cock and hiding it in other people's salad. Since evidence has led me to believe that Silent Hill 5 is currently in the hands of a pack of phenomenal idiots, the Half-Life 2 Orange Box has been pretty much the only game release I've really been looking forward to of late. The Half-Life series has always been a beacon of excellent design philosophy in the dark, wild, piss-stained swamplands of the video game industry. Not that it's been easy to remain enthusiastic over the months, Valve have been shamelessly delaying over and over again like an uncommitted suicidal looking down from the edge of a towering rooftop, and then there was that bewildering announcement that the pack would needlessly contain the original Half-Life 2 and Episode 1. Valve's weak rationalisation that pre-existing fans could give away their extraneous games as gifts was small comfort to jaded friendless misanthropes like myself. But now the waiting's over and I could gleefully sit down to enjoy the latest adventures of everyone's favourite emotionally oblivious mute, Gordon Freeman. Then six hours later I had to stand up again because I'd finished it. I can't help feeling that Valve have missed the point of episodic gaming somewhat, the whole idea is to mix up the usual rigmarole of game publishing by having shorter games at lower prices released more frequently, and while they have aspects 1 and 2 down they continue to struggle with 3. I seem to recall Valve promising that episode 2 would be longer than episode 1 to make up for the longer wait, but I guess that got kicked in the head somewhere along the line. But what the fuck, right? It's short but it's cheap and comes with lots of fun extras, not unlike your mum, so let's just run with it and talk about the game. Gameplay wise there's not much to complain about, continuing as it does Half-Life's usual extremely high standard of visual design and pacing. The hype promised free roaming environments featuring epic hunter chases and pitched strider battles, but those only really come into it in the explosive finale and everything before that is the usual linear path connecting encounter after encounter. That's fine, you know, that's the formula that made Half-Life great. But stop me if any of this sounds familiar, fighting off enemies while waiting for a very slow elevator, dropping stepping stones in radioactive waste to get across while zombies pop up to claw at your ghoulies. The set pieces in this series are starting to repeat themselves a fair bit, and really Valve, how many times are you going to make us do that seesaw puzzle? Yes, you made a physics engine, we know, well done, but I prefer it when it's just propelling ragdolls gaily through the air. Episode 2 does suffer a little from being the middle child, there's no real beginning and no real end, so the story tends to meander around and it's difficult to shake the feeling that we're just killing time before the next episode wraps it all up. A new character is brought in without warning and everyone acts like we've always known him, it's actually quite perplexing. Valve have done a great job making us empathise with all the major NPCs so far, so being introduced to a new one at this late stage is like coming home from school to find a walrus sitting at the family dinner table and you're the only one who seems to notice. The new boy is of course another Black Mesa scientist which makes me wonder if there's anyone in this dystopian future who didn't used to work at that bloody place. Let me wrap up my thoughts quickly and move on. If you've loved Half-Life 2 and all its runty children so far then you'll love this instalment because it's pretty much more of the same. If you like blazing action peppered with variety and cleverness you could do a hell of a lot worse than Half-Life 2 Episode 2 Manchester United nil. Now then, Team Fortress 2. Liverpool 3. Sorry, I'll stop this now. Chances are you already know everything about Team Fortress if you were even remotely connected to the online FPS gaming scene in the last decade or so, and TF2 is basically just that, with a makeover and all the corners cut off. A lot has been removed from the original Team Fortress classic model, but for all its insubstantiality it's incredibly well balanced now. There's a role for everyone, regardless of what sort of game you like, the heavy for uncomplicated damage soaking thickies, the spy for your backstabbing stealth game dirtbag, and the sniper for people who like point and click adventure games, although admittedly the only puzzle is use gun on man. The complete omission of grenades sounds weird at first, but it means that new players don't feel alienated by those tiresome obsessives who are all mastering the fiddly little bastards while everyone else is out having sex with girls. If I did have to criticise it, and I do, I'd say there isn't much variety in the maps. You get to decide between territory control in a desert environment, territory control in an industrial environment, or just to mix things up, capture the flag in a desert industrial environment. But I guess this kind of thing has always been about mastering something through constant repetition, and to its credit what little there is has been polished to a mirror shine. Lastly there's Portal, and if you're a regular viewer you'll understand how insane these words feel coming out of my mouth, but I can't think of any criticism for it. I'm serious, this is the most fun you'll have with your PC until they invent a force feedback cod piece. I went in expecting a slew of interesting portal based puzzles and that's exactly what I got, but what I wasn't expecting was some of the funniest pitch black humour I've ever heard in a game. Ok, it's only 2-3 to three hours long, but that's a good length for it, it means it doesn't outstay its welcome and it narrows the gap between you and the balls tighteningly fantastic ending. Absolutely sublime from start to finish and I will jam forks into my eyes if I ever use those words to describe anything else ever again. Yeah, I know it's not very funny to love a game, but fuck you, portal's great and if you don't think so you must be stupid. Stupid. Japanese RPGs and me have this little understanding. I don't play them and they can suck as much as they like somewhere far away from me. I've always felt that if I wanted the kind of experience most JRPGs offer I'd just watch a random anime series box set while pausing it every 5 minutes to fiddle around with the remote control and eat some shits. Over the years there have been two exceptions to this rule, firstly Earthbound, the quirky cartoon SNES RPG that plays like a cross between the Cthulhu Mythos and the Charlie Brown and Snoopy show, and secondly the Paper Mario series. It feels weird that a character like Mario who is about as big a sellout as a character can get without turning tricks or pennies off the New Jersey Turnpike can lend his visage to a series of games with a surprisingly anarchic sense of humour. Before I continue let me add that I know full well that Super Paper Mario has been out in America for yonks and in Japan for like three yonks, but in Australia it's only just been released and I want to review it so I'm going to and if you have a problem with that then feel free to close your eyes and stick your fingers in your 
your ears for the next three or four minutes and pretend I'm reviewing Clive Barker's Jericho or something. So Paper Mario then. There are three games in the series now, and story-wise there hasn't been much variation between them. You play as Mario in some bizarre Keanu Reeves themed universe where everyone is a cardboard cutout, and the main plot involves A, some big villain's devious plot to destroy the world, B, a lengthy quest to acquire seven or eight colour coordinated magical MacGuffins that have been scattered to various themed lands for some utterly contrived reason, and C, the princess getting kidnapped at some point because kidnap ordeals are the sole moments of interest in her otherwise miserable parasitic existence. Super Paper Mario mixes it up by introducing the concept of an evil dark world parallel to the normal light one, which may sound familiar to players of Twilight Princess or the Metroid Prime series which have already worn that particular idea down to a bloody stump. Nintendo seem really into the whole light versus dark thing right now, maybe they've been drinking a lot of Guinness. I played the last Paper Mario, Thousand Year Door, on the GameCube and I thought it was a sparkling diamond in a dark depressing sea of vomit. It was imaginative, witty and charming enough to totally bypass my usual male instinct to steer clear of brightly coloured cartoony graphics for fear of catching the gay, but after all that it was by no means perfect. It had turn-based combat, something I find about as exciting as using the toolbar in Microsoft Word, and it also had this creepy obsession with getting Princess Peach to take all her clothes off which probably came from sexually repressed story writers working too many late nights. Thankfully for Super Paper Mario both of these issues have been removed, if only to make room for new ones. The gist of the game is that it's like a cross between Paper Mario and the old Super Mario platformers, hence the title I suppose, so all the Paper Mario talky talky puzzle solvy is broken up by platforming segments, and the stupid effeminate blouse wearing turn based combat is replaced with wholesome traditional masculine head stomping. Now while I applaud every step a game takes away from JRPG territory and advise it not to stop there, the platforming is kind of bland and samey which is weird for a Mario game, but I forgive that because they earn so many points by removing turn based combat that Super Paper Mario would have to release flesh eating beetles into my house before I started seriously marking it down. Having said that I definitely feel that this game is the weakest of the series so far, at places it seems like the dev team were phoning it in somewhat, most of the graphics seem to be copy pasted from previous Paper Mario games while virtually all the new art is made up of collections of disjointed geometric polygons like it was thrown together with the Photoshop shape tool five minutes before lunch break. Also let me illustrate my next point with a slice of action from the game. During the second chapter Mario is required to work and earn money to pay for some of the mindless vandalism that comes naturally to action RPG players, and the best way to do this is to press right to run around in a giant hamster wheel for no joke somewhere around a quarter of an hour. That's if you're thick. If you're smart, like me, you weigh down the d-pad with one of your roommate's figurines and go off to amuse yourself. That's right, you have to amuse yourself while playing a game, a game being something ostensibly designed to amuse, and if the player is doing this then something has clearly gone wrong. It's an extreme but by no means the only example of Super Paper Mario's attempts to lengthen gameplay with all the subtlety and self-respect of a retarded mammoth in a Nine Inch Nails t-shirt. Don't get me wrong, I recommend Super Paper Mario if only to get some fucking use out of your Wii, but I recommend the other Paper Marios over it. The wit, the charm, the spark, they're still present and there are moments of true brilliance like the nerd chapter which might hit a bit close to home for some viewers, but the good bits are bookended by the usual JRPG bugbears of dullness and slog. It's an enjoyable instalment but the developers don't seem into it anymore so perhaps it's time to put this particular franchise to bed, then smother it to death. Every major civilization can agree that while all they're doing is trying to keep everyone fed and building enough triremes to fend off randomly spawning barbarians, wars are very annoying. Going to war generally means a lot of money getting wasted, a lot of people getting killed, and a lot of bereaved young fiancés standing around on clifftops wearing tattered wedding dresses gazing hopefully into the middle distance and going completely batty. But when a society has a time to fester and become big, rich, and stupid enough it actually starts to enjoy a good war. War means an upturn of weapon sales, the bloated government gets to feel like they're achieving something other than eating all the pies, and it thins out all those retard babies the working classes have been busily squirting out by the truckload. And lest we forget it also gives brighter young warriors the chance to earn glory on the battlefield along with dysentery and post-traumatic stress disorder. Take the superpower du jour, the United States. They're into war like it's the last day of the January War sales. The Medal of Honor series has been going on since 1999, meaning that it has officially been going on longer than the actual Second World War did, and if you put together all the games, films and TV shows that have depicted it, the Normandy landings alone probably lasted somewhere within the region of six months. So why does the US have such a fascination about a time that everyone else would rather just forget about and move on? Well, probably because that was the last war in which they did any good when they had a clear win over an unambiguous ambiguously evil villain who posed a genuine threat, rather than any of these wishy-washy recent wars where they just run in, stomp all over a developing nation and run out again declaring victory around the time the population have to start eating their own dead. Well I'm four paragraphs in and I haven't even started talking about Medal of Honor Airborne yet, but the game is pretty damn short so it all balances out. Basically you're all-American apple pie shitting bullet magnet Boyd Travers, a paratrooper who has somehow been transported into an alternate universe where the Axis forces were Saturday morning cartoon villains and everyone else is a colossal moron. The gimmick this time around is that you get parachuted in at the start of each level and get to choose your starting position, but there are usually no more than one or two safe drop points pretty close together and everywhere else is a highway to Nazi bullet bum rape. Fortunately a brace of friendly NPC soldiers are dropped into the fun with you, but they're all about as much use as a cream slice. Less in fact, at least a cream slice isn't constantly running in front of your gun while you're trying to shoot and gabbing off like it's all your fault when a stream of hot lead ruptures their pastry. Fortunately they all seem to realise how incompetent they are and rely on Boyd utterly to show them where to go and personally complete all the objectives like the teacher on a school trip. 
Unfortunately, the enemy soldiers seem to make the same realisation and will instantly start shooting you and only you the instant you expose one square inch of your lithe, supple body. And war stops being glorious and starts getting annoying when you're replaying the same fucking bastard section for the 19th fucking bastard time because you don't possess the bionic cyber vision necessary to spot all 15 hidden fucking bastard snipers who can draw a bead on and decapitate you before you can say Uncle Sam. Speaking of which, the patriotism is thick enough to cut with a bayonet, leaving aside the issue that British soldiers are all conspicuously absent, the American soldiers are all ruggedly handsome and courageous who take bullets in the gut but bandage themselves up with the stars and stripes and insist on going on in the name of sheer bloody-minded bravado. The soundtrack consists mostly of orchestral trumpet wails, so heroic and mournful you can almost picture the tears running down the musician's face, and the Nazi soldiers all look like Jürgen Prochnow and sound like Hannibal Lecter. Whenever you show up they all yell DE AMERICANA in the tone of voice Lex Luthor would use to curse out Superman. The only area in which American is depicted as worse is in the weapons, as every American-made machine gun is a pile of ass and recoil, while the only decent one is pinched from the Germans in the first mission and used for every mission from then on if you have any sense. As evil as the real Nazis were, it seems they weren't evil enough for the developers, and so the accuracy is a little bit skewed against them, and then it's skewed a little bit more, and then it's put in a thumbscrew until it resembles a slinky. I'm no historian, but I'm pretty sure there wasn't an elite branch of stormtroopers who wore gas masks, wielded miniguns, and could take three sniper bullets to the forehead before they died. And I'm also pretty sure the Nazis didn't have a gigantic armoured concrete tower that can only be described as a doom fortress. Which is weird, because going into this game I was kind of under the impression that the Medal of Honor series tended towards historical accuracy, main characters' bullet-absorbing tenacity notwithstanding, and indeed that seemed to be the case until Johann Gasmask showed up. By the end I wouldn't have been too phased if Hitler appeared riding a giant robot spider. But I guess historical accuracy is only of interest to British people and fags, so let's judge the game by its own merits. The gameplay is repetitive, the animation is jerky, the AI is irritating, and the whole game is very brief, which on reflection I should probably be thankful for. I only played the single player as usual, so maybe again the multiplayer makes up for it, but it would need to teleport whores into the room before I started caring. A world without Nintendo would be a far bleaker one than this, and yet there's something about them I find incredibly infuriating. They've got roughly enough money to buy the Earth and all the heavens, and a fanbase so devoted and rabid that they could release a game about a sewage-encrusted rapist and it would still sell like Billio. And while they sit in this position that many game developers worldwide with slews of new and interesting game concepts would happily hack off their wedding tackle to occupy, all they do is constantly remake the same games. Okay, so sometimes you've got an ocarina, and sometimes you're in a boat, and sometimes you're a werewolf having repulsive erotica drawn about you by people on DeviantArt, but pick any one of the 90 billion Zelda games there have been so far, and odds are good you'll always be the same bloody guy saving the same bloody girl with the same bloody boomerang. I'll keep the plot summary of Phantom Hourglass short because I'm sure all you clever college-educated nerds could hazard an accurate prediction as to the main elements. Princess Zelda gets herself into a pickle and has to be unpickled by the hero who is called Link on the few occasions when I feel mature enough to not abuse the enter your name feature and fagballs at all other times. Fagball starts off with just a sword and has to fight his way through quests to collect tools that will open new ways to go including a boomerang, a bow, a grappling hook, blah blah blah, yeah we've all been here before. To find out what's new we have to cross over into the realm of the hardware billies because this is the first major Zelda title on the DS and is controlled almost entirely with the touchscreen. For the most part, the movement feels natural and there's something about being able to scribble all over my maps that I found very therapeutic. The reverse effect is offered, however, by the blatant shoehorning of the DS's other exotic functions into gameplay, such as when you have to yell at the top of your voice into the microphone. Doing such a thing while out and about, which I remind you is what handhelds are for, would probably cause your own major organs to physically tear themselves from your body to escape humiliation. I suppose it's worth mentioning that this game follows on from Zelda Wind Waker on the GameCube in a rare case of Zelda Direct sequelage, meaning a return to everyone looking like they have grotesque life threat threatening head tumours, only more so because of the lower resolution. Don't feel you need to play Wind Waker first, because the requisite disaster takes place within seconds to strip you of all the possessions, hearts, friends and common sense you had by the end of the last adventure, and then having hit the reset button, the game deposits you on a mysterious foreign shore in time for another series of unfortunate events as far removed from the plot of the first game as I am from attractive single women. Hang on though, because there is something else connecting this game to Wind Waker. Remember how everyone complained about how it had too much monotonous sailing? Well, Nintendo took all those complaints on board, then threw them into a fire. The sailing returns like a greasy sex offender returning to your room at night. Instead of being in full control, though, you draw the path you want to take and the boat follows it automatically with a punishing lack of urgency. Don't think you can just set it down and go off to a trendy juice bar for a few minutes, because on the way you're certain to be constantly assailed by monsters and clipping issues. Fowerglass's other gimmick is that after each dungeon you have to go back to the starting temple to find out where to go for the next one, and while not wishing to be confrontational, this aspect of the game can fuck right off. There are three reasons why it can fuck right off. One, it's on a completely unnecessary timer. Two, it's full of unkillable baddies, creating that death knell of enjoyment, the forced stealth section, which I'd kind of hoped gaming had grown out of by now. And three, every time you return, you have to go back through all the rooms you went through last time to get to the new area. It was after returning to this godforsaken place for something like the sixth fucking time and trying to remember where all the funny shaped keys went that I officially abandoned the game along with my cherished reviewer integrity. But it doesn't bother me because I'm pretty sure I can still take an accurate guess at how the story ends. Since it raised a generation of latchkey kids and everything, it seems that Nintendo is the only company we allow to get away with this kind of thing. Imagine if anyone else did it. Imagine if Valve released Half-Life, then a few years later they released Half-Life again with exactly the same plot but with better graphics, different level design and maybe one new gun, like a tube that shoots lemons. We think they'd all 
all gone raving mad they'd be in drug rehab before Half-Life Citrus Bazooka could even hit shelves. Here's an idea, Nintendo, free of charge. How about next time you want to make a Zelda game, you don't call it Zelda. Maybe instead of fag balls, the main character could be someone else, like a dog. And maybe instead of Hyrule, it could be set somewhere original, like feudal Japan. And maybe instead of collecting tools to access new dungeons and areas, you could collect magic spells that are cast by, say, painting funny shapes with a magic brush. Hang on a second, I'm going to write this down. Over the last few weeks, most of the games I've reviewed have been either good or at least not bad enough to justify what we in the ghetto used to call getting my knickers in a twist, and since I've just received my modest tax refund, my tension has been slowly rising from not having enough to be angry or miserable about. So thank you, Clive Barker, thank you for this opportunity to unwind by calling your game a spunk-flavoured lollipop. Clive Barker's Clive Barker's Jericho by Clive Barker follows the adventures of, and when I first read the plot synopsis, this is the point where my eyes almost rolled straight out of my skull, an elite military unit specialising in the paranormal and consisting of four tough manly men and three hot sassy chicks of various racial backgrounds with only a wheelchair-bound member required to complete the spectrum of political correctness. They're flown in to investigate some kind of disturbance in some ruins in the Middle East and end up travelling through three different time periods in some kind of evil pocket dimension where some ultimate evil demon thing is trying to do something or other. The plot's about as twisted and impenetrable as a granite octopus and only serves to string together the endless identical gunfights and I have no will to live so here is my weak spot please shoot it boss battles. I'll tell you what this game reminds me of and that's id Software's original Quake. This would probably have sounded like a compliment about ten years ago but I'm sure with the benefit of hindsight we can all agree that Quake wasn't exactly easy on the eye. Which was your favourite Quake level? The Brown Castle, the Greenish Brown Temple, or the other Brown Castle? Jericho shows us exactly how far we've come, with the levels being in order, Brown Ruins, more Brown Ruins, Brown Castle, more Brown Castle, and Revenge of the Brown Castle. This might sound like a purely aesthetic quibble, but it makes the levels confusing to navigate, since if you've seen one ruined Brown Castle corridor, you've seen them all. On three separate occasions I found I was backtracking without even realising, and that's usually the point where the level designer needs to be feeling ashamed of himself. The combat is also very monotonous and repetitive, so at least you can't fault the game for being inconsistent, Jericho's approach to extending gameplay seems to be to make you fight every single monster encounter a minimum of five times. The moment you kill a given shambling grotesquery, their identical twin immediately spawns in and takes up the exact same position as his late sibling, and at places this can happen something like ten times. At moments when monsters spawn in by rising up from the ground, it turns the action into a gory, protracted session of whack-a-mole. Even a slightly interesting boss battle with a giant masked dog-like creature in the middle of the medieval stage is immediately followed by three more identical creatures fought in exactly the same way. The game is just littered with bad design choices, like worthy farm after the Glastonbury Festival. Just as an example, in the second level I was faced by a number of wartime pillboxes that diced the entire team to festive confetti the moment they came within 50 yards. Eventually one of those helpful hints that games flash up when they feel sorry for you for being so obviously retarded appeared and told me that one of the girls would run up behind the pillbox and drop a grenade in it if I pressed a certain button while in a certain position. Excuse me Jericho for not possessing the kind of clairvoyant space brain necessary to instinctively know something that has never until this point been mentioned and indeed will never be used again. I could go on listing the stupid design decisions. So I will. The game occasionally breaks up the action with altogether now God of War style Simon Says button matching sequences, which I'm informed I should probably be calling Shenmue style button matching sequences because they did it first, but frankly who gives a shit? And considering how much practice the game industry in general has had with these ubiquitous fuckers, it's surprising that there are still games that can cock them up, in this case making the indicators so small and neutrally coloured that they're very easy to overlook. But even if they were bright pink and six feet wide, it wouldn't remove the fact that the sequences are unnecessary, obnoxious, cliched and some other mean words. Maybe some of this could be forgiven if the seven main characters weren't all completely unlikable. There's so much black leather on display it's like someone took the goth clique from a small town high school, pinned them down in front of a 24 hour Rambo marathon, then smacked them brutally around the head with a baseball bat made out of frozen stupid. What passes for characterisation is an endless stream of macho self-congratulatory one-liners which they gurgle every chance they get until you're longing for the opportunity to force their noses up their urethras and let them drown in their own piss. You, the protagonist, have the ability to bring your companions back to life and it seems they have started taking this service for granted, judging by the way they waddle mindlessly into combat like a pack of bellicose penguins who have become bored with life. It's tempting at this point to let all the cockwits die as punishment for their hubris, but this still leaves the cockwit you're controlling who will yell at you ceaselessly to go and fix up the fallen comrades like you're some kind of TV repairman, and regrettably there's no option to fillet your own gun barrel unless you count the quit button. So in summary, Jericho can best be described as a hybrid of Gears of War, Hellraiser and Scooby-Doo with the contents of an abattoir slot bucket thrown over it. This is normally the point where the reviewer would say that it's for hardcore Clive Barker fans only, but to be honest I can't recommend it to them either. Maybe to someone who was really, really creepily into cranial intrusion but if that's the case you'd probably get more fun sticking a pickaxe up your nose. So I returned from my odyssey into the heartland of video game industry glamour, clutching a supermodel with one hand and brushing duck pate from my lapel with the other to find the pile of work that had felt so comfortably far away not too long ago, squatting on my desk like a big papery frog, and reality crashed down like a straight line Tetris block falling into place, taking with it four rows and the lingering remnants of my short-lived cushy celebrity lifestyle. So fuck it, back to the grind of shitty games and Windows Movie Maker. Perseus Mandate is the completely uninformative title of the new Fear expansion pack. This is the second expansion pack for Fear to come out, 
announcements, they're very easy to make. All you need to do is open the original game, randomly copy about half the levels, then rearrange them tastefully in another window. Add a new kind of enemy by reskinning an existing one and put a big picture of a main character on the box art lit from behind by an explosion and away you go. I played the first level of the original Fear a couple of years back on a friend's computer and thought it looked like the dog's bollocks, but since this was in the days when I was so poor I had to choose between games or regular square meals, when I acquired it for myself for my bottom end PC I had to turn off most of the fancy visual effects and immerse the CPU in liquid oxygen to get it to run. And once I'd stripped out the dynamic lighting and whoop de doo damaged decals all that was left was a series of boxy uninspired corridors that would have embarrassed the build engine. Two expansion packs in and nothing has changed except for the fact that while previously you controlled a mute karate kicking fear operative with the inexplicable and unique ability to slow down time, now you control a completely different mute karate kicking fear operative with the ability to slow down time, still inexplicable but apparently less unique, experiencing exactly the same locations, enemies and plot events as the last guy but with a different wisecracking ethnic support character who might as well paint a target on their face. All in all, Perseus Mandate feels like one of those clip shows TV producers use to buy time when the writers have all passed out face down in buckets of cocaine. Fear is at heart a tactical shooter and it's good at that if nothing else. The AI stands out as clever and challenging among the hundreds of games populated exclusively by suicidal retards, but after the first few encounters you've fallen into a routine of hiding behind cover, popping out, shooting anything with legs and popping back. You fought people in an office, a warehouse and a sewer and you're pretty much just going to be running between the three for the next six hours and there's this feeling that the game is rummaging desperately around in its toy box trying to find something interesting to show you. The best it can manage is to bring in slightly bigger enemies with better weapons. The first fear was an endless parade of identical gunfights broken up by the occasional slightly harder gunfights and Perseus Mandate is just a retread of that. Deja Vu lies thickly on the ground like a big fat sleeping bear. Every now and again fear remembers that it wants to be a horror game too and makes the lights flicker or throws down a random blood stain like there's someone with the world's most copious nosebleed about 50 yards ahead of you. But I have to admit when the game does descend into sheer balls to the wall mindfuckery for a few minutes it's the only time the experience really comes alive for me. I'm running down a corridor when the lights come down and then I'm in another, different corridor only now there's a blurry filter on my vision and I can hear what sounds like a moose being strangled in a tin bath. Awesome. I open a door and it vanishes into nothing and now there's a door in the ceiling. Sweet. There's a corpse at the end of the hall but as I get closer it jumps up and yells at me like everything's my fault. Finally I'm having a good time. Then everything simmers down and you return to boring predictable normality wishing you were back in the nightmare. Fear doesn't mesh horror and action as well as say Condemned does. The transition between prolonged horror sections and bouts of tactical combat occur with an almost audible clunk. And I don't know there's something about controlling a gun toting bullet time Superman that fatally undermines the sense of vulnerability horror is supposed to invoke. It's like how in Resident Evil 4 the villagers start off being scary until you discover you can blow all their heads off with a single shotgun blast and then it's all just a big old laugh. Expecting us to be scared at that point smacks of trying to have one's cake and eviscerate it too. I guess if you're a huge fan of fear, and I mean huge, like if you play it twice a day and you have Jason Hall's face stentils onto your toilet seat, and if you've got a love of repetitive tactical combat that borders on the fetishistic, and if you really badly need to know what happens next to the faceless characterless protagonist of the ongoing storyline, then I heartily recommend Percy as mandate. Maybe you could play it while you hang around the labyrinth with Theseus because you're obviously a non-existent creature of myth. In the time between the release of Assassin's Creed in America and its release in Australia, plus however much time it took for me to start giving a shit, I was inundated with literally two emails declaring its poor quality and asking if I was going to give it a sound thrashing for the rollicking amusement of all. So I braced myself for Assassin's Creed winning the gold medal at the Poo Poo Olympics, but put away your bile umbrellas, listeners, it's not bad. Not great, but only taking home the bronze at most. I'm not sure what it's done to earn so much ire from the community, it might be because Ubisoft is French and therefore full of unwashed cheesy pricks. Whoops, my mistake. Assassin's Creed was actually developed by a multicultural team of various religious faiths and beliefs has a rather perplexing opening screen is quick to remind us in what I presume is a weak attempt to placate the various religious groups who are depicted in this game as dirty and horrible. Admittedly no more so than everyone else in the world but then atheists aren't as likely to burn your house down. This video review was created by a not particularly multicultural person but who really loves religious extremists a big huggy bunch. Assassin's Creed takes place in some weird parallel universe version of the 12th century Holy Land where all the major cities are within five minutes drive of each other and follows the adventures of Altair, a member of a secret order of assassins who possesses a rather anomalous American accent. Only that's a lie, the game is actually about some dickhead in in the future, kidnapped by a rival in the biggest dickhead competition who forces him to relive the genetic memories of a 12th century ancestor, all of which sounds like a soft science nightmare, but as a device to drive the storyline it does the job alright. Also it means that you never die, you just get desynchronized in a sci-fi equivalent of the Prince of Persia's constant deaths and sands of time being attributed to him having an atrocious memory. Speaking of which, you could consider Assassin's Creed a spiritual sequel to the Prince of Persia since it's by the same company and it continues the tradition of dicking around on the rooftops of an ancient civilization. Now I really liked the Prince of Persia trilogy, even the second one where he starts listening to Linkin Park and letting his mum cut his hair because all the free running and jumping everywhere gave a great sense of freedom when you weren't being instantly killed by 10 foot drops but the linearity of the progression diminished that somewhat. Assassin's Creed doesn't have that problem, you're free to go wherever you like in each city, climbing, running, jumping, misjudging distance and face planting six stories down. It's actually fun and especially exhilarating when your cover is blown and every crusader from here to Azerbaijan is hacking at your shins. Said crusaders are rather bewilderingly quick to mark you for death though, part of that might be your fault for having an arsenal of knives and a huge neon sign saying I am an assassin strapped to your back but explain to me how this makes any 
any goddamn sense. If you make your horse walk past soldiers in the countryside, they'll all somehow twig that you're up to no good and become hostile, but if you hold down a button that makes the horse go a little bit slower, then suddenly nobody cares. Maybe the Holy Land has some kind of rigidly enforced speed limit, but watching a dashing warrior and his magnificent steed dawdling along the road like a Blackpool donkey ride is not my idea of pulse-pounding action. Another good way to blow your cover is to randomly stab innocent civilians, and trust me when I say that forcing yourself not to do so is a lot harder than it sounds. Those wacky, fun-loving lepers have this hilarious tendency to shove you with all their retard strength and send you flying ye olde mosh pit style, which I feel makes me well within my rights to lamp them one, but then everyone turns against you because apparently it's not as funny when you do it. And then there are the beggar women who will latch onto you like a lamprey eel and constantly run in front of you whining for coins in a manner scientifically designed to get on my tits. Then I give them a gentle discouraging knuckle sandwich and they run off yelling like I'm the asshole. It hits particularly close to home for me because this is pretty much how all my relationships turn out. Assassinations are a tiny percentage of the game experience, but I guess faffing about Creed doesn't have the same ring to it. The developers can't seem to grasp what it is that makes their game fun. The actual assassinations, planning the route to the target, stealthing over Hitman style and sticking blades up their ass, they're great fun, it's just that it takes way too long to get to those moments. First you have to walk all the way down from your home base at the top of a fucking mountain at the start of every fucking mission, then you have to make your way through the target city, pausing occasionally to nut the lepers Glaswegian style, then you're forced to do a few errands around the place, which are basically the same three side quests over and over again, and when you do finally get to stab someone up it's all bookended by long, wordy, unskippable cutscenes. Even after the stabbing you have to sit through a prolonged conversation with the victim, you'd think having a spike shoved into the throat would impede one's ability to soliloquise, but you just can't shut these twat mouths up. Also, while the running and stealthing is awesome, the sword fighting sucks a big fat coxicle, and after the speed kill system from Two Thrones I thought Ubisoft understood that. But for the entire last hour or so you do nothing but fight off waves of baddies that make space invaders look conservative. It's like you're enjoying a nice, if rather bland, grilled cheese sandwich livened up by intermittent lumps of Branston pickle when someone snatches it from your mouth and replaces it with a spoonful of watery ejaculate between two pieces of wood. Overall though, I like Assassin's Creed, at least it's trying something new and different to the legions of clones stanking up the market, and it kept me interested enough to see it through to the end even when it did endeavour to shit all over itself. It certainly taught me to ignore people who email me, not that I needed another reason. Give it a chance, but I can't blame you if you end up trying to fire it into the sun. Guitar Hero and I have a history. Sometimes it's been a good and loyal friend, sometimes it's bent me over the furniture and wailed on my ass with a steak tenderizer, but I take all of that with good grace because we both know that the promise of simulated rock stardom will always bewitch the pasty nebbish fantasists that are gaming's core demographic. It all began when I and some colleagues were around a friend's house for completely heterosexual reasons and we broke out Guitar Hero 1 on easy mode in celebration of our manliness and complete lack of desire to fondle scrotums, and once we'd reached the point where the game wasn't yelling at us all the time for sucking so much, that is, sucking at the game, not sucking each other's dicks or anything, it was a lot of fun. Its triumph was in following the philosophy that if you're going to make a game designed to humiliate the player, the least you can do is have some decent music in it. So while we all stand up there holding undersized squeaky Fisher Price plastic guitars as you told a small yappy dog, we could at least close our eyes and pretend we were on stage with Joan Jett, holding a small yappy dog, Guitar Hero became one of the staples of our weekly manly get-togethers along with lifting weights and talking about chicks, and when the time came for us to move up to medium difficulty it seemed like an impossible task. I'd gotten so used to only using the first three buttons my pinky finger was an atrophied pork scratching stuck on the end of my hand with Pritt stick. Once again the house rang with the plunks and wails of missed notes, but it never stopped being fun even when I was having to duct tape bags of frozen peas to my arms to stop them seizing up. And when Guitar Hero 2 came along, well obviously it was time to gird our loins, grow enormous beards and move up to hard difficulty. Again it seemed like madness, actually having to move your hands up and down the neck to hit the fifth button felt like a good way to get wankers cramp. But I kept playing and eventually some kind of breakthrough was reached around the time I was jerking off some tattooed love boys and everyone had a good time. Don't believe the lie of Guitar Hero 3, it's actually the fourth title in the series, the third being Rock the 80s which I haven't played but the day I fork out 70 bucks for an expansion pack is the day I swallow razor wire, pull the end out of my ass, and floss myself to death. Guitar Hero 3 is the hasty cash in the public Pushes through together after they left the cage door open and the old Guitar Hero developers escaped into the wild. Unnecessary changes in lettering and graphics give an unscrutable feeling of unease as if a stranger has come into your house thinly disguised as your best friend and you're wondering if he intends to leave soon or murder you and cannibalise your body. But the point I'm trying laboriously to get to is that Guitar Hero 3 made Guitar Hero stop being fun. Oh, it was fun for a while, rattling off the ridiculously long hammer-on sequences in Cult of Personality like the fretboard was the crotch of a loved one and I had only a vague idea of where her clitoris was, was challenging enough to make me feel awesome for pulling it off, but then I got to the last venue and the last group of songs on hard mode and came to a screeching halt because they are fucking impossible. No, stop. Do not reach your email client. I do not want to hear about how you five-starred Blood Rain on Expert because if you did, you are a fucking freak. A freak with either three arms or a trained pet spider working the buttons for you. But aside from erecting a massive brick wall at a point around three songs before the end, Guitar Hero 3 brings a couple of other new things to the table. Co-op career mode is a welcome addition despite there being no faster way to fall out with someone. Battle mode though feels a wee bit broken. The first time we played, the very first power-up either of us acquired crippled the other player and ended the match within five seconds in a clear case 
case of what is known as Mario Kart syndrome. As for the whole Legends of Rock thing, perhaps Legend of Rock singular would have been less misleading because the only one is Slash from Guns N' Roses. Well, there's some guy from Rage Against the Machine too, but wishing no offence to the man if he's a Legend of Rock then a grilled cheese sandwich is hot cuisine. Everything Guitar Hero 3 brings to the series is balanced by what it left out. For one, co-op career mode is nice, but plain old co-op quick play mode is out on its ear for no adequate reason. For two, the game has more product placement than the last Terminator movie and about as much dignity. For three, what happened to Clive Winston? He was my favourite character. For four, what the fuck happened to Clive Winston, you pricks? In his place we've got some multicoloured giggly J-pop creature and you can't play classic rock with that thing, it's like cock slapping the Mona Lisa. Anyway, a review of Guitar Hero is always going to be abrupt because they're little more than jazzed up colour matching casual games, it's still a good thing to have around at a party when everyone's drunk and gotten bored of Pictionary. The song list's got some pretty good stuff, some pretty mediocre stuff as well, but hasn't that always been the case? On the whole though, it's just not as good as tonguing another man's balls. I mean as it used to be. I'm not gay. I've already covered in this weekly adventure into good-natured fond ribbing that I think JRPGs can all suck on the unpedicured toenails of a menopausal Valkyrie. Western RPGs, on the other hand, I've had a more changeable relationship with. While JRPGs generally involve a bunch of angsty 20-year-olds with stupid hairdos following a strictly linear storyline when they aren't standing in a row in front of dancing goblins arguing over who's on potion duty, Western RPGs tend to feature more variety and less skinny underdressed girls claiming to be men. Someday I want to make a list of all the games that feature as the protagonist, a grizzled, generically handsome, short brown-haired guy. I'm sure I'd end up with something populated by roughly 70% of all the games ever made ever. Mass Effect is gratifyingly different by letting you choose between various styles and shades of short brown hair and fully customise your generic handsomeness and grizzledom levels. Well that's a little unfair, you can be a grizzled short brown haired girl too. I eventually went for an ugly motherfucker who looked like a cross between Pete Postlethwaite and Tom York so it would be funnier when all the female characters started wanting to ride my purple python. This is the part where the reviewer talks about the plot to put off having to actually make valid points. It's half past the future and humanity is up on the galactic political stage having a dick waving competition with a variety of alien races who all speak English and pleasant North American dialects for some reason but I guess it's preferable to all those Wookiees in Knights of the Old Republic gargling in your face all the time. The main guy, whose last name is Shepard and whose first name in my case was Titty, is a human soldier guy who gets a new job as a galactic peacekeeper guy called a Jedi, I mean Spectre. Soon enough the shit hits the hyperdrive and it's down to Titty to save the galaxy. Now pad out my last few statements until this paragraph is roughly the same length as Marcel Proust's A la Recherche du Temps Perdu, then read it out loud to yourself while occasionally flinging the text across the room so you have to go pick it up again and you'll have a pretty good idea of the Mass Effect experience. People often say to me, Yahtzee you Calipigian Superman, how can you, a game writer to yourself complain about a game having too much dialogue. I would reply for the same reason that a hairdresser is entitled to complain when someone fills their car with shampoo. The best writing in visual media is succinct and punchy, something a lot of webcomic writers need to understand. Mass Effect is like an incontinent who just drank six bottles of Mountain Dew, so full to bursting with dialogue that it leaks out at every turn. Characters will spout their life stories at the slightest provocation like you've got a documentary crew with you, a mere glance at a computer screen or Starship component will dump an entire reader's digest into your journal. To the game's credit, you're never actually required to read any of this, but not doing so leaves with the strange feeling that the game somehow resents me for it. You see, whenever you drag the game kicking and screaming away from its beloved dialogue and force it to live up to the whole action RPG thing, it throws a great big sulk. During combat, your companions get in your way constantly, possibly because they want to be ready in case you order them to give you a reassuring cuddle. Some enemies seem to be affected by the same motivation and will run right into your face, and since there's very little immediate visual difference between an enemy and a friendly of the same race, the word clusterfuck ceases to be adequate. Then there are the unavoidable driving sections, made frustrating by a vehicle that handles like a fat man on a unicycle. The menu system isn't what you'd call intuitive, the game brings over almost everything from Knights of the Old Republic for better or worse, including the tedious micromanaging of equipment like some fussy mother getting her children ready for the first day of school, and I was six hours in before I figured out how to install weapon mods. I could have looked in the manual I suppose, but by then I was halfway through the game and reading the manual at that point felt like a sign of weakness. I knew this review would be difficult going into it, partly because I skipped all the side quests and probably missed half the content, and partly because I suspect that some of the things I didn't like are the same things that RPG fans find attractive. The first point probably doesn't matter so much unless one of the planets boasts a magical make the game better button, but the game's sheer head crushing depth will probably make up for everything for some people, so what I'm saying is that if you like RPGs, and Knights of the Old Republic in particular, then take this review for the ignorant hate speech that it is, but if you don't like RPGs then Mass Effect isn't going to cause an epiphany. Finally, the smartest idea Bioware had was to leak the fact that there's sex in this game, that probably doubled the sales figures right there because the nerd is a tiresomely predictable creature to whom the promise of boobies is like a bacon sandwich to a starving wolf. For the record it was the female human I ended up filling with my toothpaste of love, but since her name was Ashley Williams, which I'm pretty sure was the full name of Bruce Campbell's character from the Evil Dead series, it made things rather uncomfortable for me. You only get to see like one second of bare arse anyway, so it'll hardly make your mass erect.